Well, good morning, everybody. It's so good to see you. And we had a tremendous conference last week. How many were there? Enjoyed that? That was awesome. And uh, a big thank you to our pastors, Pastors Bert and Charnay. We were so thankful. And Pastor Pearson and Blessing. And then as well, Pastor Mike and Paula for all they imparted into us. Um, I was forever changed. I'll never be the same. We talked about consecrated change. How many believe that they have been changed forever? Real change. Not the, the fluff, not the pie in the sky, wishful thinking, real change. I'll never be the same. Amen? And uh, uh, again, thank you to Pastor Mike and Paula. They finally have left and gone on vacation. We kicked them out. Said, you got to go. Get out of here. So they're enjoying themselves in, in Aruba and spending time together. But they are watching with us this morning. Would you give them a great hand? Thank you for being with us. We love you. So thankful for you, your faithfulness to the call, your loyalty, and your love for people um, impacts us and forever changes us and uh, changes us. And we are behind you, we are with you, and uh, excited to to be a part of the team. And I think that's that's really my thinking. I'm just excited to be a part of the team. You ever uh, play a, played on a sports team and you look around, you realize that there's a lot of really good players on the on this team. And uh, anybody, you, you, you ever did that? You're on a team, you're like, man, I'm just, I'm just excited to be here. I'll sit on the bench, whatever. I, I'm just looking around. I was like, man, there's some good players on this team. You know, that's what I feel like when I'm up here and when I'm, when I'm with, with you at the conference and with our pastors. I'm just excited to be on the team and doing what God has called us to do. What, is there anything better? There's nothing better than this. There's nothing better than seeing lives changed. And, you know, I, somebody made the, the, the comment. He's like, you know, I just... I really, I don't, I don't get why there's always salvations and stuff. Doesn't it get old and, and altar calls and different things? And I'm like, man, it's like that, that's the only thing I live for, seeing people experience the freedom that what God has done in me. That, that's all there is to live for. And so I encourage you, if you're not on the team, get on the team. It's exciting. God's moving. He is working. And we are anointed to, and we uh, talked about that during the conference, and I want to talk about um, anointed to multiply, and I want to speak about the seed this morning. Somebody say, the seed. Today's message is called the power of the seed. Power of the seed. I actually brought some seeds with me today. I don't think you can preach about the seed without talking about the mustard seed, so it might be a little cliche, but we're going to dive into it a little bit, and um, I want to briefly mention the mustard seed, see if I can get a few out without making a mess. I'm going to pour them out here. But uh, these are very small seeds, and the Word of God mentions it a few times, and in a few different books, the different uh, apostles talked about it, and as Jesus taught about the seed. But the mustard seed is a very small one. It's not very big. And, um, and so we're going to talk about the power of the seed. Many people want, you know, we'll talk about it in, in just a little bit, the, the now, and we want things now. Um, you know, if you ever um, went to get a hot dog and said, I'll have ketchup and mustard, and uh, they handed you one, one of, oh, I dropped my seed <laughs> on the hard soil. That's the wrong sermon. But if, if they handed you this to put on your hot dog, it's not going to work, right? Because we want our mustard and we want it now on the hot dog. This is a seed. Mustard comes from it. I don't know how, but somehow they make mustard out of, comes from, from this bad boy right here. But you know what? It has the potential. Many people don't see the potential. It's the power of one. You know, it, we were always taught here and being with Pastor Bert and Charnay, it's not about the building. It's not about building a big church. If you want a big church, this is the wrong place. We're not here to have a big church. Pastor came, came by one time, we were building this building, and um, we just had no room. It's zero room. If you're at the conference this Past weekend, again, somehow every three to four years, we just don't have room. I don't know what it is. But there's no room, so we had to, we had to expand. We had to, to build out. We had to add services. Why do you have so many services? So we can fit everybody, because people are getting saved, you know? Church. Jesus, that's what happens if you do the Bible. And, uh, and he said, uh, oh, you're, you're building. It doesn't look that much bigger. Why would you, you just build a fancy building? I was like, no, it, it, actually, it actually is bigger. Yeah, well, well, you guys had a, a, a building that was just fine. You know, why'd you spend all the money to do that? I was like, well, we got to fit the people in because 
The lost are coming in and getting saved. We're, we're not here for bilateral transfers. Right? Those don't normally work out too well. Anyway, because when you, you come to 3C, you realize that we got work to do. People got to get saved. People need Jesus, starting with our families. Amen? I'm going to move on. Power of the seed. Let's open up. Let's read the Word of God because that's what matters. Matthew 17, 20. The Passion Translation. I love how this um, portrays Matthew 17, 20. It says, He told them it was because of your lack of faith. Somebody say, my lack of faith. It was because of your lack of faith. I promise you, if you have faith inside of you, no bigger than the size of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move away from here and go over there, and you will see it move. There is nothing you couldn't do. I don't know about you, but there's some times in my life where I look back, and there's some things that I faced, and I thought to myself, you can't do this. I'll give you a... Funny but not funny story. I might get in trouble for this. Um, when I first started in the ministry, I graduated in South Africa. I was there for about 13 months and was in, in pursuit. And, and I came back over here, began to work and trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. I knew I didn't want to do the, the secondary things that I always dreamed of in sports and music, all that. I, I wanted to be in the ministry. And so I knew that um, as, you know, I knew that's what I wanted to do. But um, 3C Dulles wasn't in the picture yet, so that meant Pastor Justin, my older brother, um, my youthful adversary, was working here at the time. And so he was, he was pastoring here, and there was a, a, a joke because I would get sent to the hospital a lot, and I apologize if it was one of your relatives, but there was a joke that every time I prayed for somebody, they got sicker. <laughs> Justin thought it was the funniest thing. Like, not funny, but you know, just, just take it lightly, it's not... Not a big, big deal, but my nickname was the Pastor of Death <laughs> from Justin. It was a brotherly joke. And I, you know what? I took that real. Inside of me, I was afraid to pray for people. I'd go in and be like, oh, she's doing well or he, he's doing good. And I'm like, well, let me just quickly pray real quick and, and then I'm going to head out. I'm glad everything's doing. I pray and we get a call like, we need another pastor to come. Something happened. But inside of me, as a 20-year-old, I was nervous. And inside of me, now I'm going to switch to more serious, and when I would go to pray in real situations, in the back of my mind was like, every time you pray, something bad happens or nothing happens what, what you're saying. And you know what? I had to actually remove what was once a joke, those seeds of doubt within my heart, because there's no way I could serve the Lord without faith. Because then I can't please God in my life. I can't please God as a husband. I can't please God as a father because it's our faith that brings pleasure to him. It's our faith that impresses him. Jesus wasn't impressed by the Pharisees. He wasn't impressed by all the knowledge. He's like, I need disciples that aren't full of themselves. So he went and found a cussing fisherman. We got a bunch of those here. Don't look at your husband. I saw a couple spouses go like this. God's not through with you. So if you're a cusser, God wants to use you. Amen? Amen. What am I preaching about? Let's get back to it. No, but we can't, we can't allow seeds of doubt within our lives. He says it was because of your lack of faith. It's because of that. We need faith. Amen? 2 Corinthians chapter 9. If you would turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm going to read out of the New Living Translation real quick, but I want you to see this. I want you to look at it. In verse 10, it tells us this. It says, For God is the one who provides the seed to the farmer, and then bread to eat. In the same way, He will provide and increase your resources, and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. I'm going to try to not preach a whole sermon on this because there's so much in this one verse. Number one, what does God provide? Seed. Okay, let me ask this side. What does God provide? Seed. Okay, very good. Whom does he supply it to? I might say the farmer. All right. And what do farmers do? They sow. They plant. All right, what does God provide? 
He provides seed. See, many people skip to the, the fruit. I've had many conversations with people who, you know, in the world or they look at my life and, you know, I've got a, I've got a, a marriage, married young and kids and it looks contrary to the world. That's weird. I got married at, you know, like we we're like 21 years old or whatever. Like, why are you doing that so soon? You have a whole life to live. And you know what? The enemy lies to a culture and they waste their best years to get married and start having kids. I don't know about you, but I need all the energy I have, my youthful energy, to raise the three that I got. <laughs> and I thought Noah was going to be my sweet, calm boy. That boy is a wild child, straight from the gates of heaven. <laughs> Ready to rock. He'll jump off this stage, no problem, land it, do a front flip, and go, ah. I'm like, dude, what? In the, what? <laughs> He's crazy. But you know what? God provides the what? The seed. To whom? The farmer. To what? Don't eat the seed. Stop wasting what God has given you. Amen? Somebody say, I'm a farmer. Yeehaw! Amen? So what does God provide? I'm, to whom? What do farmers do? They sow seed. One more time. What does God provide? The seed. Whom does He provide the seed to? What do farmers do? They sow seed. Okay? I think we got that. Now, let's take a look at farmers versus consumers. Consumers, what do consumers do? They consume. Amen? Lost my place. Consumers take for the now. When you consume, it's, I want it now. How many, you get hungry, you're hungry and uh, you're, you're driving down the road and you feel the hunger pains and you look you're like McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, Chipotle, Five Guys, Arby's. 13 going, going south there. Right? Green Turtle, Longhorn, Olive Garden, right? Red Lobster. But at some point you give in. Five guys, we turn it wide. We give in because whatever the appetite is, when there's an appetite there, you're going to eat, right? But you know what? Our culture has designed it that everything is for consumption and you can get it now. It's your money. Get it now. Not tomorrow. Now. Like, stop yelling at me. You can have it now. Why is everything now? Our young generation, and it's, it's kind of funny, we're laughing, but my wife and I, we minister to the young kids every week, to your kids, your grandkids, to the vault, which I love so much, a lot of world changers there. But this culture has told them that they can have whatever they want, be whatever they want, and they can have it right now, and nobody can say anything about it. Instagram, Snapchat, Instacart. Everything is, you can have it, and you can have it now. Sounds a bit like Lucifer. See that app over there? I know you're not supposed to have it, but go get it. You can have it now, and you can be just like God. It wasn't so much of an evil, ooh. It's probably more like our commercials that you hear in America. Because he was very persuasive. Let's get back to the message. I want to finish. I'm doing better than last service. Consumers take for the now, but farmers... Plant for the future. You see, God thinks a lot different. His word is a lot different than the way that this culture will train our minds. That's why he says, I don't think like you think. I have to tell myself this. God does not think like this world thinks. God does not think like the U.S. Treasury Department. Thank God Almighty. God doesn't make decisions the way the United States makes it. The greatest country in the world. God doesn't think like us. Farmers plant for the future. Somebody say, I'm a farmer. Somebody say, yeehaw. You see, we plant seed, but we don't plant seed or sow seed because we believe that the increase is from us. We believe that it's coming from something else. Let's talk about the actual mustard seed. You can plant a seed. I can plant this seed. And the only thing I do is give it up. The resource that I have, I give it away. It's out of my hands. The growth, I know, doesn't come from me. I don't know what happens. What is it, like photosynthesis or something? Is that what it is? 
Photosynthesis. Like it doesn't come from me. It doesn't come from anything that I can do, right? So my wife, um, she loves this fruit called dragon fruit. We went to Florida and she fell in love with it. Yellow dragon fruit. I'd be lying if I didn't fall in love with it too. It's real good. But Sam's Club in Salisbury had a shipment in a couple months ago and we bought a lot of dragon fruit. We had dragon fruit for a long time. And she did something because we can't grow anything in our house. It's terrible. I couldn't even grow a yard of grass. It looks like the Sahara. And, um, and so she took a few seeds of, of the, the dragon fruit before we, we, we ate them all. And she took just a few seeds and she threw it in this little container. I think she looked up how to do it, threw it in the container and then left it and put it aside. One day she came to me. She's like, Jared, Jared, look, there's little sprouts of dragon fruit. I'm growing it right in our pantry, like right for everybody to see right in the window. There's basket, little thing, little things growing. Like we need to move that to a different window. <laughs> Never mind. A... Jesse knew what I'm saying. <laughs> Got a little growery right in our, in our front window by the, so the whole world can see. But Emery didn't know what that was. She walked in thinking it was food, picked up this um, Tupperware container, and she shook it to death. So all of the work that we put into growing that is gone. But how many know that it, it had nothing to do with us? When the seed, when you give that seed and the resource is gone and it is, it is buried, it is something divine that takes place that God has created. But it's the same thing spiritually. When we make a decision to sow a seed, it's not because of who we are. In our ministry, when we're, when we're reaching out to people, when we are discipling people, it's nothing that I can do. I am nobody special. I am not qualified. It is by only the grace of God that He has allowed me to do what I do. Simple as that. By the blood of Jesus that we're allowed to do and that God has graced us to do what we do. You don't know my family. We're weird. <laughs> Written houses are strange. We've got a weird sense of humor, and you should come to one of our family reunions. You'd be like, you all pastor at 3C? Like, yeah, it's by the grace of God. <laughs> We're all strange in the Rittenhouse family. <laughs> Sorry, I'm disrespecting my family, but they know what I'm talking about. It's not about who we are. It's about who he is. We're farmers. We sow seed. We don't dig it up. You know, Pastor Bert talked about that a little bit. We sow the seed, and then we dig it up. God, are you doing anything? Okay, I'm just making sure you, you've got it. You've got it. And we, we put it back. Okay, God, I know, I know you have. I know you have. Next day, like, oh, we've got we to gotta dig up the seed, make sure we're... That's, that's no faith. Farmers, they work in faith. They understand that when you plant the seed, and you do what it takes, you water the soil, the sun's out, the soil's ready, we're not going to get into the, the planting of the seeds. That's a whole different sermon. But we understand that it's God who does the work. Amen? Amen. And in Matthew 9.38, it says, So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. I'm not in charge. God is in charge. Come on, tell somebody next to you, you're not in charge. God's in charge. Funny thing is, you're not in charge, but you're responsible. Adam wasn't in charge, but he was responsible. We're responsible. The Bible says much is given. There's a requirement. God has given us so much, especially in our nation, especially in our families. We are blessed. There's a requirement for your life, people of God. The seeds that have been placed in your hand, God is saying, I trust you with that seed. What are you going to do with it? The story of the talents. I'm not going to get into that either. It's a whole other story. We could say, you know what, God, I, I kept my seeds all right here. I got my little savings account here. I'm all prepared for the future. I bought all my bullets and I got all my, my food that lasts 100 years. I'm all, I'm all ready to go in my little hole here in case the world ends. You know what? God doesn't bless that. God doesn't multiply that. God loves people of faith. God loves to see people who are willing to say, I've only got a few seeds here. I'm not going to do too much for me anyway other than survival. So Lord, 
I plant those seeds in faith. That's what God multiplies. God doesn't multiply pride. God doesn't multiply anything that's not humility. When he saw pride in heaven and it began to grow, he kicked it out. That's another sermon. Maybe you got to kick somebody, kick somebody out. Get the devil out, not, not somebody. Kick the devil out of your house, amen? So who's in charge? Who's in charge of the harvest? He says, ask him to send more workers into his fields. Send more what? <gasps> I got to work. Yeah, you got to work. Farmers work. Most of the time, I believe they're up earlier than anybody else. And I think that's why there's daylight savings. Isn't that from farming? I believe so. So who's in charge? Somebody say the Lord. Send more what? Workers. Farmers. Sowers of seed. People who are willing to do the work. Say, I don't want to work. Well, guess what? The kingdom of God is not like the U.S. government. You're not going to get a welfare check. There's no stimulus. You have to put in the work. You actually have to love people. i got to love people. People suck. Yeah. People suck. You work with people, you understand. People, they bite. Sheep bite. My dad always said, ministry, sheep bite. You're a shepherd, guess what? Sheep bite. Just put some gloves on and keep working. Somebody say, I am responsible to, the, to sow the seed I have been given. One more time without my stutter. I am responsible to, do, to sow the seed that I've been given. All right, Moses. We're going to move on. It's been a long week. 1 Corinthians 15, back to the Word. Verse 37, it says, And what you put in the ground is not the plant that will grow, but only a bare seed. A bare seed of wheat or whatever you are planting. It's the, what I was saying, the I want it now mentality. Everything is now, now, now. Praying, oh God, will you, will you just give me a faithful cell? Just a group of guys that are on fire for God and faithful and loyal to me. Wouldn't that be nice? But that's not how it works. It's like praying, God, will you just give me three beautiful, obedient, loving, trustworthy children? Would you just give it to me right now? It doesn't work like that. We think it does, but you know what? Sometimes it feels like you're trying to disciple demons to angels. I know that because my brother and I didn't have the best reputation growing up. They're the Rittenhouse boys breaking another stained glass window, getting caught in the kitchen during church. It takes time. It takes discipleship. We were reminiscing this past week about the, the start of the tabernacle, which this is the, we, we're 3C now, we've come together, but when we started, we were the tabernacle. And my dad told us to pick an instrument. I picked the drums. I was terrible. Justin played the keyboard. He actually played for real. And we started my dad singing. I was on the drums and Justin was on the keyboard. And I wish we had video because we would be viral for how bad and how funny it was. It was, it was crazy. I'll tell you one quick story. I'll never forget. I'm on drums. Justin's on keys. We're not quite serving the Lord, but we're serving the family. And I believe, I might get the story wrong, my dad went for a key change and said, to take it up, behold, he comes, right? And Justin goes, Dirt, what are you doing? <laughs> and my dad went, just the voices, behold, he comes. <laughs> I'm just on the kick drum like, oh, someone's getting a beating. But you know what? I look back, it's only by the grace of God that we're here at this place, and it's not a building, it's the people. It's simply making a decision to lay down your life and to sow seed. There is no way when I was a kid that we ever thought that we'd have a conference like we just had with the anointing and the people and the salvations and the lives impacted. I never thought it was only by the grace of God. And you see, if you try to wrap your mind around the potential of a seed that you're about to plant, you're just fooling yourself because he said, I'm going to blow your mind. It's going to be greater than what you ever thought. You say, well, I've been through things and there, there's heart. Yes, it comes with hardship. 
It comes with loss. It comes with pain. It comes with wounds. But he says that I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And when you get to the finish line, you're not going to look pretty. You should be absolutely wasted. God, I've given everything I have. There's nothing I have left. God, I finished the race. Amen. You don't got to have it all together. You just got to trust the Lord. Disciples take time. Those of you, cell leaders, and you're, you're ministering to people, it takes time. It doesn't just happen. You got to love people. That's why you have to be in it to the end. And it's not all, it, it, it doesn't always feel good. The emotions aren't always there, but it's the call. It's the heart of the father. The heart of the prodigal son. You see the heart of the father. I don't know. He gave him a lot of money. I don't know if that's, if that's the heart of the Father. He did, he did hand over quite a bit of money to him. But you know what? He was there with open arms. He never, ever, ever turned his back. Thank God he doesn't turn his back on us. Amen? Amen. I hope you're hearing this this morning. Um, let, me, let me continue. Um, it's, it's very important. I'll just say this. We have to understand the power of the seed, but understand the power of our words. I, I don't want to miss this. Parents and, and uh, marriages, be, I used to say, be careful what you say, but I was extremely rebuked by the Holy Spirit. It stopped saying, be careful. It's not about being careful. Being careful means you have the wrong heart and you need to be careful. It's like, you know, uh, like, oh, I gotta, I'm, around, I'm around the pastor. I got to make sure I don't say anything bad. Or like, oh, I thought my mic was on. I've done that a few times. It's not about being careful. It's about being intentional. There's a difference. You see, we're in, it's not I'm careful with, with the seed. No, I'm intentional with my seed. I'm intentional with my children. I'm intentional with my wife. I'm intentional with my disciples. Everything we say bears weight, and everything we say is a prophecy. Everything we say, every word we speak. I, I remember... I'll tell you a, a story. I used to play baseball. I played travel baseball, and I was, I was really stinking it up for a few months. And we were doing these tournaments, and I was just, I, ne- I could not get a hit. I was struggling, and I was the leadoff. You know what a leadoff is? Their job is to get on base, and I could not do it. And we were going to the World Series, me and my dad. This was before we started the church. We went out to Kansas City, and the coach pulled me aside, the head coach. He says, if you don't get it together, I'm going to bench you. So in my mind, I'm like, you stink. You can't hit, and you're going to be on the bench. The assistant coach came up to me. I'll never forget this. His name was Coach Bennett. He came up to me, and he said, he said, everything you need to be successful is on the inside of you. Those seeds are there. But for some reason, you got, you're thinking wrong. You've accepted. Now, this is a bit more preachy. It wasn't as much. There might have been a few foul words in there. But he said, Every, everything that is in your mind, you've accepted negativity and doubt that you, that you can go out there and be you know, what you need to be. He said, I want you to forget about everything negative and just, I want you to imagine you getting up there and hitting a home run. That's all I want you to think. Just absolutely crushing the ball. As a kid, I'm like 12, 13 years old. I'm like, all right, I remember doing this. He said, don't think, just do it. And so I went up there and it was the first bat of the World Series. I'll never forget it. And I didn't even hit a lot of home runs and that swing, first at bat, first pitch, I cranked a home run into left field as a 12-year-old kid. And I never forgot that because I literally had to pull out the seeds of doubt and I had to make sure that the seed of faith was on the inside of me. Now that's about sports, but you know what? How many times do we hear a seed of doubt and we sit on it and we accept it? I'll tell you one more story. I'll, I'll try not to cry. So um, Noah is, is our, um, he's almost two. He's my wild son. But there was one Sunday and Pastor Bert was here. And I just, I was about to come on stage and do ministry time. And I believe it was the, it was the second service. I got a crazy phone call from my wife. And, um, and she said, something's wrong. Um, I'm trying not to cry. She said, something's wrong. There, she was pregnant at the time. I probably should tell you that. She's pregnant. She said, something's wrong. There's blood everywhere. And I think I'm losing the baby. Like, And Pastor Bert just got done speaking um, about the power of, of what we speak. And, and I remember hearing that. 
And, but in my mind, I'm like, I'll be right there. And um, so I went to get in my car, and I began to proclaim that you can't have my son. And I begin to denounce, you know, my wife was saying, I think something's wrong. And we begin to prophesy. I said, there's nothing wrong. Satan, you cannot have my baby. He is a promise. I begin to apply the blood of Jesus over her. And in my mind, I'm, all I'm doing is battling my flesh. All I'm doing is battling these seeds of doubt that I'm contemplating receiving into my life. And I was in a battle and I got there and it didn't look good. There was blood everywhere. My son Hannon was in the middle of it. It looked awful. Our white sheets were covered with blood. And I began to plead the blood of Jesus. I began to plead and said, Jesus, I know your promise. And I know your word. And it's yes and amen. And I do not receive this seed of death. I do not receive this. And obviously, you know, the end of the story. We went to the hospital and we didn't know what was going on. But everything worked out. And and I believe, some people, oh, well, well, you know, nothing was wrong. No, I believe in the miracle working power of God. I believe in that every seed that we sow. And listen, everything doesn't always, we, we look at circumstances and things go different ways. And I, I'm not here to say I, I know why and I don't understand everything, but I know this. I know that with faith, the Bible says all things are possible. Pastor Bert spoke of, during conference, grapes or he spoke of seeds, sorry, seedless fruit. I actually had to go to the store this week and um, I was at Sam's Club purchasing a kid's snack and it was grapes. And I began to think of what he was, um, was preaching about. And he was preaching about seedless fruit and he made the comment, he said, seedless fruit is for selfish consumption. It's altered that we can just consume. Not only that, when I got there, I found seedless grapes that are flavored cotton candy. The first service didn't get it either. These are grapes. They're seedless. And they're flavored like cotton candy. Cotton candy. This is a fruit. Y'all getting it? I'm not preaching right now. I'm just trying to get get on the same page. America has created a seedless grape that tastes, I know they started playing, at the, probably not the best time, cotton candy. <laughs> Does that not blow your mind? Yes. Cotton candy. <laughs> and it doesn't even taste like it. But there's no seed. And I looked up, so I, I did some research. I'm like, how how do they make this? You know how they make it? In order for this to to make it and for them to be able to to create this, it doesn't come from the seed per se. They have to go to the plant that was was originally messed up that somebody found and wasn't producing grapes that had seeds or whatever and they did their science thing. But in order for these grapes, the lineage to survive, A branch has to be cut off the vine and replanted. The only way for this to survive is to take. You hear me? When we live a lifestyle that is about it's mine and no one else can have it. What God has given me is for me and my family. When we live in a selfish lifestyle that is all about the secondary things of life. What do you mean the secondary things? Listen, no, there's nothing wrong with having a nice house. There's nothing wrong with having a nice car. There's nothing wrong with owning a boat. So I'm not coming to, if you got a boat, don't look at your husband when I, when I talk about a big boat, all right? There's nothing wrong with that. Those are the secondary things of life that if it becomes your focus, that you lose out on what God has for you, the fullness of what God has for you. There's nothing wrong with that. I have a nice house. I have a nice car, but it's only by the grace of God. But guess what? You can have the house, you can have the car, I don't care. What matters is the people. But in order for that lineage of those greats to survive, it is only take and survive. Take and survive. Don't get caught up in the rat race of getting what you can get to survive. He says in Psalms, David says when, I'm just going to read it. I got it right here. Why, Why do my own version? Somewhere. 
In Psalms 37, 4, he says, Take delight in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust in Him, and He will help you. You don't have to focus on getting those things in life. You don't have to put all of your effort into just surviving. The power of the seed is multiplication. The power of the seed isn't in the plant. It's in the possibility of what it could be. Do you realize the potential that is in the seed of your life? Do you realize the potential that your children, that your grandchildren have? You say, well, I messed up or I didn't do everything perfectly. And I've gone through this. We all have. We've all messed up. None of us got it right. But you know what? Right now, what God has given you, he has supplied you with seed. You have a responsibility to get that seed in the ground, to plant that seed for a harvest for generations to come. You don't have to survive. Christians don't survive. We thrive. Christians don't, oh, I just want to make it by. What a sucky life. What a terrible life. We're here to conquer. He will supply your need, and I don't care if gas gets to $10 a gallon. It don't matter. If you're in the kingdom of God, they can do whatever they want. They can cut off every pipeline and put batteries in every F-350. It don't matter to me. Guess what? I'm still going A to B. I'm still going to go house to house. We're still going to do the work of the Lord. Amen. The power of the seed. The power of faith. It's not just getting by. And I know sometimes it can feel that way. And life's not easy. I don't belittle the situations we go through. But I just know a little bit what what God did for me. What God did for my family. You don't understand, Pastor, I've been through this. I understand a little bit. I knocked on the doors of addiction. I was on that path, I, I could have went down there. My brother, same thing. We were, we were at the gates of hell, but by the grace of God, it's only by His grace. I'm here to tell you it's nothing special, but my family, what God has done, He will do it for you. It's too far gone, it's not too far gone. You're watching today from Bethany, it's not. What you have, what God has given you, get it in the ground. Don't just keep it for yourself. I want to close out with this. And Pastor Pearson touched on this, and it's been on my heart even the last month. The language of God is dreams and visions. That's how He speaks to us. He speaks to us through dreams and vision and through His Word. And what happens is, is when we get so caught up in dreaming about the wrong things, and I've been there. I've been there. I was sitting with one of my guys this week I'm going to tell him a little bit I don't know where he went he's not up here and we're sitting in the car we just got done working out at the gym we're sitting in the car ordering food believe it or not ordering Chick-fil-A and uh, this beautiful truck pulls in front of us and I'm already preaching I was in the, at the gym I was already thinking about this message I've been praying and he said one day one day I'm going to have that truck and in my mind, I'm like, man, that's, that's good faith. But I was, I was taken back and I said, you know what? No. I said, Kason, don't dream of those things. God has a great life for you. Don't fill up your heavenly network with the dreams and things, the secondary things that you can t- attain from this life. Don't waste that. What happens is we fill up, I'll just say that heavenly network, the dreams and the visions and the creativity with the things of this life. And it's so mesmerizing, so easy. A buddy of mine has a boat. God's blessed him. I went out on the boat with him. We went to Annapolis under the Bay Bridge. And, and I got home and for two weeks, I searched for a boat that I wanted to buy. I don't need a, I'm the last person that needs a boat. But you know what? It's so, we're so easily consumed by the things of this world where God's saying, dream of me. Dream of your children. Dream of your grandchildren. Fill up that heavenly language. Need, there needs to be a connection there where you're hearing from God. Don't fill it up with things that don't matter. Hear from Him. Clear up that network. And if you have a bad network, switch over. Right? If you don't have signal, get your signal right. Don't be consumed by the secondary things. Amen.
Let's stand together. Don't be satisfied. God has more. You say, I've lived a good life. You know, things are, things are good. Don't be satisfied. Don't be satisfied with the way things are. You, you ever go to dinner, or maybe a, another dinner, you're watching people eat, you're sitting at a table and find that everybody is on their phone? You ever seen that? We try not to be that. So if you see us at dinner, don't be like, Pastor, you were preaching about... I was answering my WhatsApps for the kingdom of God. Because <laughs> I have 54 groups. Um, you know, what happens at, you know, you're sitting there at, at dinner, everybody's on their phones and there's no real connection or conversation. Everybody is satisfied with their phones. They're satisfied where they're at, but there's no interaction. It's kind of a picture of how we can be with God. We get satisfied with the secondary things. We get satisfied with our careers. We get satisfied with getting the home, getting the car, getting all that. That's not the focus. The focus is simply this. What God has given me, I am responsible. What is it for? Empowering people. Simply empowering people. It's all about relationship. And one thing I've learned, and I've learned by mistake, I've learned by error. I've learned by following my pastors. It's not about, when it comes to sell, it's not about the meeting. Cell is not the meeting. Cell is relationship. What Jesus did, it wasn't about his time that he met with his disciples. They did life together. And you see, if you're at a place where you don't want to do life with other people, it's just you and your own, I'm sorry, but that is prideful and selfish. And that's not how God works. And you'll always be limited in your life. The harvest that God has for you will always be limited if you're at a place of where it doesn't take faith. It's always about other people. It's never about me. It's always about others. Amen. Amen. I encourage you today. Take the seed that God has given you. If I can pick one up. Take the seed that God has given you and give it away. Plant the seed. Get the seed in the ground. It says that he will supply everything you need and that will also create in you a heart of generosity. Right? Here. I give you a seed. You can have my seed. There you go. Cameron? Be a giver. I'm so generous. Come. I'm going to give you a few more. What are you going to do with the seed? You're going to give it away. Cassandra? I'm going to give you some seed here. What are you going to do with the seed? You got to sow it. Give it away. I don't got much. Give the seed away. Get it out of your hands. The story of the little boy and the disciples and Jesus fed 5,000 plus it took a young man saying this is what I have it wasn't enough you say well why give it away it's not even enough I barely have enough for my family absolutely just do it just give it to God better in his hands than mine amen I want to pray with you this morning Bethany thank you for being with us today and I want you to just stay with us a moment more I want to pray those online, thank you for being with us. We're going to pray together, and then we'll, we'll separate from there. But just, again, want to really thank you for being with us. Can we give them a hand? Thank you so much for being with us today. We love you. If you would, just lift your hands to the Lord. I, w- I want to pray. Good morning. What a powerful message this morning. And, you know, what I, what I liked about what Pastor Jared has said is we need to stop boxing God into what we think our life should look like. Such a powerful word, the power of the seed. You know, God has so much more for our lives than we could ever ask or imagine, you know, but we need to let him take charge. So many times we try to take charge of our life instead of just having responsibility, but we need to allow him to take charge of our life this morning. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says that when you give your heart to God, the new life is, new life becomes old life is gone and the new life has begun 
So I want to pray with you this morning, and I want to ask you, if you've never given your heart to the Lord this morning, or maybe, you know what, maybe you have given your heart to the Lord, but you you fell back. You know, you've walked away. You're, you're not serving Him. I just want to ask you to make that decision this morning, because it all starts with a decision. It's the first thing we have to do is make a decision that we are going to serve Him and walk this journey out with the Lord. So if that's you, either one of those things, I just want you to pray with me. Repeat after me this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you. For dying on the cross. For dying on the cross. For me. For me. For my sins. For my sins. For my past mistakes. For my past mistakes. I thank you. I thank you. That they are all gone. That they are all gone. You washed them away. You have washed them away. I accept you into my heart now. I accept you into my heart. And my new life begins today. And my new life begins today. My new journey begins today. My new journey begins today. As your word says. As your word says. I am a new person. I am a new person. The old life is gone. The old life is gone. And the new life begins today. And the new life begins today. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. In your name I pray. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. If you made that decision today, there is a link in the comments. We would love to meet with you in the Zoom room. Um, this is all about connection. You know, you can't do this by yourself. I couldn't do this by myself. You know, where there is team, there is conquest. And we want to get together and connected with you. So if you would meet us in that Zoom room, just click on that link. It'll take you right to us. And so we will see you soon. Thank you for joining us at 3C USA. 